uh, welcome to the uh, session on education and training in crisis. My co-chair uh, for this session is Dr. John Hunter, who's uh, chairman of the Department of Surgery at uh, Oregon Health Sciences uh, University in Portland. Uh, I think we have a, a great uh, program planned uh, with uh, really a lot of uh, tremendous uh, speakers and people who are well-known figures uh, in American surgery and education. And um, the, uh, the, if this is your uh, first session, uh, you can tweet your, or message your questions and they'll show up on the screen and we'll deal with the questions at the end of the session. Um, I, this is a critical time in education and training in our country. There have been so many changes that have taken place over the next few years. And this will be a little bit of a look at some of those and, uh, and perhaps some of the things that are coming ahead. So to start the session off, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing to get senior medical students ready for surgical internship. Here are my uh, disclosures, none of which relate to the content of this talk. So uh, we would certainly all agree that there have been tremendous changes that have taken place in surgical training over the last uh, many years that have impacted training of our residents and fellows from the work hour restrictions to increasing pressures in the operating room to more complex patients, all the regulatory and supervision requirements and so on. And so uh, more than ever, the importance of surgical skills training outside the OR is clearly recognized. Now, medical students are often a ne neglected group um, and they, but they may suffer in skills development for many of the same reasons that residents do. And furthermore, uh, their skills development and, and knowledge base may vary tremendously. Uh, certainly there's been less time spent on general and other surgical specialty rotations over the last uh, several years. Our residents in their 12-week surgery block may spend four weeks on surgery, four weeks on a non-operative musculoskeletal rotation, and four weeks on anesthesia. So they often get very little exposure in the third year. In addition, the, the changes in practices within our academic medical centers have often limited students' exposure to broad uh, surgical disease, and there's just a lot of variability in their participation in clinical decision making and hands-on patient care uh, from school to school. Um, the current structure in the fourth year uh, really doesn't uh, lend itself in many respects for preparing these students. Uh, it's mostly an elective year. There are few, if any, actual requirements in the fourth year. Students who are going into surgery certainly do sub-internships, in and they often do one or two away audition rotations, if you will, of variable experience. And so I think it's pretty clear that the current generation of students are at a, uh, a disadvantage at the very beginning of internship. Now, there have been a number of uh, skills-specific uh, courses that have developed over the last uh, several years. Uh, these are four that uh, were reported in the, in the uh, early to mid-2000s. Uh, uh, most of them are descriptive with a few outcome measures in terms of showing improved confidence levels and that sort of thing. And in 2006, because of this perceived need, we developed a, um, a, a focused skills course for fourth year students going into any surgical residency uh, training, uh, which we called Accelerated Skills Preparation for Surgical Internship. So we opened it to any surgical student, whatever their surgical specialty plans, and uh, as of this year, we've had uh, over 100 students who have participated in this program. Um, many of the programs are a month-long, all-day-long course. We simply didn't have the resources to do that, and so we structured this as seven weekly, uh, three-hour sessions uh, that we held in the spring of the senior year when the, the, uh, we felt this would be most timely. The typical format was a short didactic and then hands-on instruction and practice. And one of the things that we felt was really important was to build some assessment into this uh, course. So this is the, these are the basic sessions that we did that would cover, I think, many of the skills things that you would anticipate uh, a new surgical trainee would need to have under their belt. There was a heavy focus on the suturing and knot tying a component, uh, knowing the surgical instruments, um, and the various other things that are listed here. One of the areas of focus is the on-call management problems. I'll say more about this uh, at the end of the talk but I think it's a real area of gap in students' preparation uh, for surgical uh, residency. And then uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, most uh, popular features of the course was a, we, uh, an animate lab, which we used to, for the students to bring together all of their experience at the end. They actually got to practice all of these techniques on live tissue, and we had them do laparoscopic access, a lap coli, then they open and close the abdomen, do intestinal resection. So they get to lot, do a lot of suturing, cutting, clamping, tying, and that sort of thing. 
Uh, the assessment piece is outlined here. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I want to show you just a couple of bits uh, from the course. So these are data on suturing and knot tying performance, pre-course and post-course for the five fundamental tasks that we outlined, simple interrupted suturing, subcuticular, one and two-handed knot tying, and tying in a restricted space using an instrument pass. And the student's performance improved significantly on all five of these tasks from pre to post course. I didn't, did not, don't have time to show the data, but we also did videotaped uh, assessment of performance and their technical proficiency skills improved consistently as well. And the thing that was uh, interesting is that when we compared these to end of R2 year residents, for three of the five tasks, the students' times were not significantly different from those of the residents. Uh, there were a couple that there were, um, and I think we can even approach this more closely, and we have some recent data showing that we're reaching that point across all of these um, time points when we really focus on a proficiency-based outcome performance. The other primary assessment measure was a survey. Uh, the uh, five domains that we looked at are listed on the left, and we rated them on a one to five. Students self-rated their, uh, their confidence levels on a one to five scale, from one being no knowledge to five being highly uh, competent. And just two slides to show you those results. So at the beginning of the course, the pre-course is shown in the green, the post-course in the orange. Uh, students didn't have high confidence on any of the domains uh, of, uh, for 45 questions at the beginning of the course. Uh, but at the end of the course, they had a high confidence level in 50%, uh, and their confidence levels uh, were low in only a, uh, uh, in, a, in a relatively small percentage. And this just shows the average rise in scores from pre to post course and um, the number of questions where the scores improved significantly out of those 45 questions we asked. And notice the one highlighted acute patient problems is the one which we saw the least amount uh, of improvement and I will come back to that a little bit later. Now uh, recently a group at the University of Minnesota has uh, published uh, really a, a phenomenal analysis of the impact of a month-long course on students' uh, performance. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but this was a uh, five day a week, uh, six to seven hours a day for a month. Um, and they looked at both technical and cognitive patient management aspects. Uh, they measured uh, a lot of different things, uh, 32 different job related tasks. And they had a number of study groups, both their participating students, some matched peers, and non participants from outside institutions. And uh, the bottom line is that the participants showed marked improvement uh, for in all of the tasks. They had improved scores on written and technical skills exams. And significantly, they outperformed their peers in July of internship. Now, this was based on detailed performance evaluations that they then carried out in the first three months of internship. And the interesting thing is that by the third month, that advantage had largely dissipated. So it seems like a main part of what they were accomplishing is really giving the interns a jump start at the outset of internship. Another really interesting thing they looked at was the impact on duty hours. So they tracked these in a, in a, in a subset of, of uh, course participants and in 17 non-participants. And they found that there were significantly more duty hour violations in interns, new interns who had not taken one of these courses. More 10-hour violations, 80-hour violations, and 30-hour rule violations. And these findings also diminished by the third month of internship. So I think this is a really interesting observation in terms of the impact of what these courses can do. Now, the, uh, the college, the Association of Program Directors, and the Association of Surgical Education formed a task force for development of a national standard internship prep curriculum. This was chaired by Rebecca Minter, uh, who's done an outstanding job leading this group. And the first step was to undertake a needs assessment for the fourth year uh, to determine the pre preparation of current interns and to, and to compare preparedness of interns who took a course versus those who had not. So this is the study design. This was a survey of interns from 11 general surgery programs. So instead of one program, they looked at 11 different programs. And they also s surveyed 11 senior residents to get them to rate the preparedness of their current interns. So um, interestingly, medical knowledge and patient care, they, uh, 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 from the intern survey, they found they were only moderately prepared but they thought they were pretty well prepared in terms of skills like professionalism and communication and practice-based learning and that sort of thing. 
although 15% of the interns specifically cited difficult professional interactions and communications as one of their most challenging scenarios. From the resident survey, they felt they could do things like writing orders and notes and interpreting labs, et cetera, but they, they were not good at interpreting x-rays and EKGs, managing fluids, leading a code, uh, recognizing some of these uh, uh, acute, urgent surgical problems and performing some of the, uh, the essential uh, technical skills. Now, when they compared students who had had a so-called boot camp skills course in the fourth year for versus other interns, uh, they found that the, um, the, the uh, performance was significantly improved throughout all of these categories of technical skills, professionalism, communication, and overall preparedness. There were some common themes that emerged. There was a lot of anxiety from the interns in terms of lack of preparation related to a technical skill or procedure, particularly managing or prioritizing multiple simultaneous demands, being first responders, managing some of the common post-operative problems and the difficult communications. And so what I'd like to do is just um, to uh, go through a few of the verbatim uh, quotes that came out of this survey. So as a part of this, there was an open-ended question survey in which the interns were asked, what was the most challenging clinical scenario that you faced in internship? Um, and, and so you can see them, some of them listed here, all aspects of patient care from routine to a code. Patient crashed, uh, unprepared for the medications they had to order, or being asked to do a bedside procedure uh, that they'd done before, but now that was several months ago, and so now they were un unsure about uh, whether they remembered the various steps or not. Cross coverage is a big issue. Our students today get very little experience, in fact, if any, with that. Um, one student said they'd never participated in a busy overnight call as a medical student. You can imagine uh, the, the, the problem with that. And then the third is night float by far. This was another common theme that came out. Uh, just in terms of other patient care issues, uh, doing some of the very fundamental skills, students don't get to do that much today. Some institutions, they're going to have to do the most difficult ones and being uh, the one to actually make a decision. And then uh, this was a really interesting um, uh, comment, which uh, uh, Dr. Mentor has uh, pointed out in, in prior presentations, but uh, one student had a patient who had an evisceration at the bedside with coughing. And that individual didn't realize that the patient was supposed to have the fascia closed and that this was a surgical emergency. And you can imagine how now that some students may spend their general surgery block only on breast endocrine or on the MIS service and have may, maybe have never seen an abdomen opened and closed. And so you can begin to understand how something like this might occur. The senior resident survey sort of... Uh, uh, um, came down to three primary things that they felt the interns struggled with. And the one, one was ability to manage multiple patients and prioritize. Second was to be a first responder and initiate workup for patients who are having acute problems. And then uh, communicating those findings to a senior uh, level resident fellow or faculty. Um, and these are data from our own survey of students taking our accelerated skills course at Washington University. And I think if you look at these numbers, you can begin to understand why our students are having a problem with some of these acute on-call problems and the issues of managing patients at night. Um, I've listed there, these are uh, survey results. And so self-reported number of call nights in the third year, maybe doesn't look too bad. But in the fourth year, students take very little night call at our institution an average of around seven nights of call on a surgical service for the entire fourth year. Now, <clears throat> in order to begin to address some of these deficiencies, uh, this, uh, the college and the APDS and ASE have uh, developed a, a national skills curricul curriculum, as I've alluded to. The outline is uh, indicated here. This is a work in progress, but there's a tremendous uh, work that's been done by this group already. Uh, curriculum goals and objectives have been developed. Uh, there'll be a modular format for, the, for these. Uh, they're in the process of identifying the content for the objectives and there'll be a web-based interface uh, for this uh, curricular content. So this is going to be a tremendous uh, resource uh, for uh, institutions and, and departments who are looking to develop these kinds of skills programs for their fourth year students going into surgery. So if I can just uh, summarize, I think uh, uh, that the 
current generation of surgical interns are not well prepared at the outset of residency. Uh, it's clear that skills training in the fourth year does result in improved performance, higher confidence levels, and uh, it appears improved performance during internship. But, there, uh, but this won't address all of the issues. There are a lot of deficiencies currently in the fourth year curriculum at most medical schools in the U.S. And I feel strongly that these need to be uh, restructured to address some of these <coughs> issues in terms of the, particularly the on-call and night uh, float uh, system so that students have this experience before they start internship, as well as some of these other areas uh, as well. And I would just leave you with this quote, which uh, was uh, uh, made by Dr. Foltz in his presidential address to the Central, Central Surgical Association uh, 15 years ago, that we failed to use the fourth year of medical school effectively to prepare our students for entering their surgical residency. And I, I think that the, the time has come uh, for us to change this once and for all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brunt.